to today's energy seminar, which is in fact a panel discussion on a topic uh, that seemed timely a week ago, and perhaps you tell me even more timely today, given the events that unfolded last week. And the topic of the panel is climate-wise choices in a world of oil abundance. And uh, to introduce the panel, uh, we have our own very excellent uh, professor of energy resources engineering in the School of Earth. Adam Brandt. Adam. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we've got, a, we've got a, a panel discussion today. It should be interesting and fun. Um, uh, here today, we've, we've actually got all the main uh, PIs on this project, which is a nice, uh, in, too infrequent chance for us all to get together. Uh, so you guys get the, the full um, complement here. Uh, on the, on the um, far end, we have John Kumi, who uh, was affiliated with the Steyer Taylor Center uh, here at Stanford and now with um, uh, 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 Earth System Science uh, and School of Earth Sciences. Uh, Jewel Bergerson is next. She's at the um, Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering at the University of Calgary and is an expert on life cycle assessment of uh, fuel processes. Uh, and then Deborah Gordon, um, uh, next to me here, uh, has been leading this project and really spearheading a lot of the um, uh, fundraising and outreach. She's the director of the energy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And so she's really been the glue and the, and the sort of uh, uh, fuel for this project to move forward, so to speak. Um, in addition, a whole bunch of graduate students and researchers have been involved, uh, three, at least three of which are in the audience right now, Stanford students, uh, but a number of um, also junior research fellows at the Carnegie Endowment uh, and graduate students at the University of Calgary have been involved as well. So we certainly want to want to thank them. I'm going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes um, to give some sort of uh, context and, and general results. Um, Debbie's then going to walk through uh, some uses of the web tool. One of the cool parts about this project is that we've developed a user-friendly, uh, very sort of interactive uh, web tool uh, that allows people to explore uh, uh, these issues from the comfort of their home. Uh, so Debbie will, um, will lead us to that, and then we'll have hopefully about a half hour of, of um, uh, panel discussion, John will moderate. We'll try to move to, to audience comments earlier rather than later uh, to get as much feedback and interaction as possible. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, okay, so, so oil uh, has been having a tumultuous uh, time over the last decade. Prices started low, they got higher, they got even higher still, uh, and recently in the last uh, year and a half to two years they've crashed back down uh, to inflation adjusted lows. Uh, at least some of this can be laid at the feet of the commercialization of high volume hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. Hydraulic fracturing has ex existed for a long time, but this new uh, development was really a, almost a qualitative shift in the, in the type of resource that could be accessed, opened up huge volumes, uh, particularly in North America, uh, to exploitation. This has caused a production shift uh, from the Middle East and, and former Soviet Union uh, to North America and has actually precipitated a uh, really amazing um, reversal in, in uh, the United States, at least, where 40 years of oil production declines were almost um, completely reversed in the space of five years. At the same time, pressures grow from outside. Fuel economy regulations, not just in the US, but internationally, have been made more stringent. Electric vehicles certainly threaten. They're still small, but on the horizon, uh, you know, maybe this is a potential competitor for oil. And climate concerns have certainly led to development and subsidies for alternative fuels, uh, things like ethanol advanced uh, cellulosic technologies. But for the time being, oil still remains strategically important and worth studying. So, uh, you know, one big picture framing question is how much oil will we actually need? So this is um, uh, data from about 150 different countries around the world. Uh, production uh, of oil from 1900 uh, to the present here, and each, each country is a band. We can plot on top of that uh, uh, um, projections for the future. So my, my postdoc, Mohammed was working on this. Uh, he's in the audience, I believe. We co collected every projection from the IPCC 2000 uh, scenarios. Um, uh, um, uh, that, that basically met a screen to where they they're still uh, seem to be valid with the historical uh, sort of um, trends that have happened since the year 2000. The brand new set of scenarios from 2016. Uh, every oil company projection, mostly from the major oil companies uh, that we can find those, typically go to mid-century, as well as government organizations such as OPEC, um, 
uh, IEA, uh, EIA, etc. So you can see these make this whole sort of forest. Um, lots of people have ideas about what the feature are. They don't necessarily align. Okay. One way to, to, to make sense of this sort of noisy picture is to actually accumulate. And cumul uh, accumulating the, uh, these um, uh, consumption volumes gives us cumulative oil consumption in a billion barrels and really smooths this historical trend and actually gives us a nice envelope of futures here. So all these messy, all this messiness here uh, arranges uh, more tidily. Uh, pretty interesting thing. We've used about 1,300 billion barrels uh, to date historically since the start of the Industrial Revolution. And consumption, even in the most optimistic scenarios, and we can talk about whether IPCC has scenarios that are really optimistic enough, uh, but even in the most optimistic scenarios, we're consuming about another trillion barrels, up to potentially five, th uh, five trillion barrels. Okay. So how much oil do we actually have? So it's useful to plot against, this is the consumption side. Uh, here's here's the, uh, the availability. This is conventional oil resources already consumed is hashed here. So this is most of that historical consumption. These are current reserves from BP. And then three estimates of, of additional technically recoverable resources defined probabilistically from the USGS. So this is the low estimate. We're 95% likely to exceed that. This is a very high estimate. We're only 5% likely to exceed that. And this includes reserve growth of existing fields plus undiscovered oil assessed last in 2012 by USGS. So we actually have a lot of, of uh, conventional oil left to be consumed. In addition though, we've, we've got uh, what's called heavy oil. So heavy oil and bitumen I've, I've graphed together here. These are resources that are very dense and viscous, difficult to extract um, uh, and, and refine, uh, but available in large quantities. Already consumed is small. Here's reserves. And then three estimates of um, recovery factors at some indicative um, uh, or three estimates of, of technically recoverable at some indicative recovery factors. That's been well known. These resources have been known for centuries in some cases um, and are largely being uh, produced in Canada and Venezuela uh, with additional production in, in California. The new entrant though is, is light tide oil. Light tide oil has only been produced really uh, in commercial volumes for the last five to 10 years. So very small amount of, of cumulative production. And reserves are uh, classified uh, inconsistently and unclearly at this point. However, the US Energy Information Administration has released a global report suggesting that global resources could be 400 billion barrels. Okay. What's really interesting though is you dig into the appendix of this report and you see that that actually is assuming a 5% recovery factor on an 8 trillion barrel resource in place. There's been upwards of, of 30 to 40 papers published in the last two years on, in Society of Petroleum Engineers literature about increasing the recovery factors of these tight oil resources. And some suggest that you can go above 50%. So if we take this 5% recovery factor to 15 or 30%, this adds this large increment of oil here. All this is to say that it's not clear uh, to me at this point why folks are concerned about availability of oil resources. It looks like between additional technically recoverable conventional oil plus uh, heavy oil, which we know how to extract, plus tide oil, which we, uh, we know how to do enhanced recovery on, or at least we're starting down that path, looks like we have a lot of oil. To give some context for this, EOG Resources out of Texas just released um, some initial results of enhanced recovery on Eagleford Shale. They think they can increase per well recovery by 40 to 70% at an incremental cost of $6 a barrel using enhanced recovery. So taking this 5% to 10% or 15%. And it's likely we can get more. So there's a lot of oil out there. If oils are abundant, how do we choose? What sort of um, metrics do we use? Uh, we think that oil climate impacts uh, should affect this choice because these impacts are highly variable. Uh, we've undertaken a multi-year effort, which we call the Oil Climate Index, to understand oil emissions. Debbie has really led this. Uh, in the current incarnation, we have 75 major global fields, which represent greater than 25% of global production, current production. So these are very large, globally important fields on average. We then use three open source academic models to estimate emissions from these fields. Uh, and we create a, an interactive web version, which Debbie will, will walk you through. Let's see here. Uh, an important uh, facet of this work is that we take what we call a barrel forward approach. 
Traditional life cycle assessment, of which Jewel and, and I have published many, typically take a more consumer-oriented uh, product backward approach, where you start with, say, a liter of gasoline, and you work all the way up the supply chain and count all the upstream emissions associated with that fuel. So this can answer questions like, which fuel is best? How much better is my EV per mile? Uh, these sorts of things. This is the traditional product or consumer-oriented uh, life cycle approach. Instead, in the OSCI, we take one barrel of crude in the ground and work it forward and count all the downstream emissions associated with it. The numbers here are more relevant to producers and governments and really speak a little bit more to the carbon risk associated with different resources. What's the embedded carbon in a barrel? Uh, how does this project raise or lower uh, my sort of portfolio of carbon risk? Okay, so this, this OCI approach is more relevant to, to somebody who's developing the resource. This is maybe more relevant for a consumer trying to make a good choice. Okay, so there's really two different perspectives on the same problem. How do we do this? Uh, we used a, a set of three open source models. We'll talk about two. Uh, for upstream, we use the Oil Production Greenhouse Gas Emissions Estimator. This is a tool we've developed uh, at Stanford for the last five years or so. It models all upstream greenhouse gas sources using field-specific engineering models for things like lifting, compression, surface processing, reinjection, this kind of stuff. Open source, completely accessible, easy to download. Lots of people are using it all over. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's really developed in this, in this open source methodology. And I'll note that for the 75 fields, we've, we've actually made public every data input to the model so anyone can recreate the results. Um, uh, next, for the refinery model, we, we uh, use a model called Prelim. This is Jules' model uh, from her group at Calgary. It's the Petroleum Refinery Lifecycle Inventory Model, which models uh, using three possible overall refinery configurations and like 11 detailed. Um, uh, refinery flow paths, uh, models all the, uh, the refinery greenhouse gas sources associated with producing an oil, and it uses crude sp or crude specific properties, API gravities, cut points, um, uh, properties of fractions, to estimate both the type of refinery that it would likely be sent to, most profitably sent to, as well as the emissions associated with each processing unit that the crude goes through. Okay? And so the emissions from these processing units are a function of the crude properties, the volumes that go through each processing unit, et cetera. So here are just some quick results from the per barrel approach. You're not meant to see the, the, anything uh, uh, here except the sort of the general uh, shape of this. Debbie will show the interactive version of this curve. But you'll note we've rank ordered them largest to smallest. And from the smallest emissions here to the largest here, there's about a 60% increase from under half a ton per barrel uh, to three, almost three quarters of a ton per barrel. This is quite a bit larger than the increment associated with the product backward approaches, okay? And this is for a variety of reasons that we'll, we'll uh, talk about there uh, later. But this fairly significant increase, so it really matters if we're picking our barrels from here or here if we think we're gonna consume a trillion more of them. This matters at very large scale. So why might we have a larger spread in our sorts of study? One of the interesting things is that the drivers of emissions can be synergistic. Heavy oil is difficult to extract, often requires steam injection. It's, it's challenging to refine, so it requires excess hydrogen. Uh, and results in a higher carbon slate of final products, more heavy fuels, more residuals, more petroleum coke. When you add all these up and trace the barrel down through the supply chain, you see a larger impact than just working from, say, a, a liter of diesel backward. Oil field age can strongly affect emissions from conventional fields. As more and more water is produced, fields get increasingly monetarily expensive to run, but also energetically. A lot of pumping energy and processing energy uh, for what can be a small amount of oil. That's really how oil runs out uh, in a conventional field. Enhanced recovery can be energy intensive with quite significant separation, reinjection, and other processing emissions. We then use this to generate a, a probabilistic view of these three, same three classes of fields that were on the, on the last slide, conventional, heavy oil and bitumen, and light tight oil. And using, uh, in this case, we have 59 conventional crudes, 11 heavy oil crudes, and five light oil crudes. We can see probabilistically uh, the distribution are in kilograms of CO2 uh, per barrel. Some interesting things here, the, uh, the filled distributions are sort of the default distributions, and you can see the heavy oil and bitumen really stand out here. There's, of course, some overlap, but the body of the distribution is higher um, by something like 100 to 200 kilograms per barrel. 
We also see here that the shift between production and refining and final fuel emissions is different in these three uh, classes of resources. We can also see in these, in these light blue uh, uh, non-shaded distributions some mitigation options. So for example, we take uh, flaring from conventional oil resources and we set the flaring rate equal to the best observed uh, practices uh, in our data set. Uh, we can see a shift uh, to the left, removing some of these high emitters. This is even more the case in the case of light tight oil, where we see a pretty significant shift because some of these regions in the Eagleford and Bakken that we model have quite high flaring rates. For heavy oil and bitumen, the mitigation opportunity is different, and this is to avoid burning the pet coke or the residual uh, solid uh, material that comes off the bottom of the barrel. And so by doing that, you can get something that looks like 100 kilograms per barrel uh, shift in that distribution, which is pretty significant. Uh, right now, about, I would say, something on order half of, of, uh, of pet coke from the oil sands uh, is burnt, mostly. Um, uh, shipped away from the United States refineries. Almost all of the pet coke from California heavy oil production ends up being shipped abroad and burned. So if we can, if we can address that, that's, a, that's an obvious opportunity. So takeaway points, and then, and then we'll let Debbie uh, walk you through the web tool. There's a lot of oil available. Uh, if, you, if you don't think conventional oil is enough, there's a lot of heavy oil and bitumen. There's a lot of light, tight oil. You can strongly augment conventional oil. Each oil resource has a unique impact profile depends on the operating characteristics and lots of other uh, chemistry of the fuel. But heavy oil, and, heavy oil and bitumen resources tend to be higher. Light tight oil are lower, particularly if you control flaring, they look better than conventional oils. There's a bunch of obvious mitigation options that exist, such as minimizing flaring and avoiding pet coke consumption. The, an interesting opportunity here with pet coke is that it, it's a very low value fuel, and so the producers only forego a relatively small uh, drop in revenues for a relatively significant uh, carbon reduction. Okay, so we're going to load up the, the web tool here and Debbie can show you um, all the things we can explore here. Okay, let's try to make this brighter here. I think we need to turn some lights down. Yeah, let's see if I can turn some lights down here. So while Adam just on, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so just to put kind of a geographic face on all that Adam was discussing, um, early on in this project, we agreed that there are big differences, and we were shocked at how large the differences in, in greenhouse gas emissions were between the oils that we modeled in the first phase of the OCI, which was only 30 oils and 5% of global production, that those differences between these oils emissions were large and large enough to matter. But what was interesting in going to the second phase and going to 75 global oils, as Adam said, about 25% of global production, was to try to put a face on the globe. And what turns out is that there really is no country that owns good or bad oil. There's a huge geographic distribution of these oils around the world. There's even more oil in the ground to manage. And really, any country can manage their oil better or worse, depending on um, what their options are. So I was going to just zero in. The, the um, dots here are flaring, which we were able. I can't do this with one hand. Hold on. <laughs> I need two hands to do this. <laughs> Sorry. There. I just want to show you because this was worked on very hard by one of Adam's graduate students. So this is zeroing in on Alaska North Slope. And the dots there are some flaring. It's not a very highly flared field. And um, but the boundary is interesting because that's the boundary of the oil play. And what you can start to see is you can look from space, which is where our satellite data comes from for the flaring, but then you can look on the ground of where that oil play is geologically, and you can start to tell a lot about what's going on from under the ground and from space at the same time, which is really kind of the perfect way to think about oil. It's something that's very deep and something that needs to be managed from afar as well. Um, then just in terms of... Okay, Adam, where'd it go? It's Adam's. So 
just to put a face on the what Adam was just showing you, but in a more of a fixed route, this is the sum where it's upstream emissions are the dark, midstream is the middle, and downstream is, is to the right of these different oils. So not only are you talking about and comparing the total emissions of these oils, you're really starting to get smart about where the emissions reside for an oil. So in other words, where is the most challenging part of a barrel of oil? Is it in its production? Is it in its refining? And when it's in its downstream, what are the products that will actually lead to its different emissions? So there you can see, and you can swap these around in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions per megajoule of product. You can actually swap them around. I think this is a really interesting one. If you think that we knew you know, types of oil and they were pretty homogeneous, you can see here different types of oil from conventional to ultra deep to watery to depleted to ultra light. There's a lot of variance in emissions even when you're talking about a certain type of oil that you thought was pretty standardized. These barrels are really mixing themselves up. And then I wanted to show you here just to give a sense of an oil that Adam was talking about. Oh, hey. There it is. So this is Texas Eagleford, which is an interesting one. This is the a very compli complex field down in Texas that happens to be very highly flared. These data come from NOAA. They're from a satellite that NASA operates, so they're, they're real-time data in terms of flaring. And what's interesting is if you just compare, as it's currently operating, to what could happen if this gas was well-managed. If you notice that top bar there, it went from its current operations here with 574 kilograms per barrel of CO2 equivalent emissions. And if you really do operate this field responsibly, you end up with a 93% reduction in upstream emissions and you know a 27% reduction in overall emissions for selling the gas, for doing something that could be economic. But a lot of these considerations, I will add, are things that the oil industry doesn't always normally think to do first, because their goal is to make money on producing this oil. And if you put the artifact of climate over the oil sector, it's a newer realization. It's something that the oil industry has not had a long time to really put their minds to. So we found out from folks in industry responding to this tool is it's helping them learn how to manage their oil better. And a lot of folks in industry need to be taught how to think about a social consequence like climate change. And then the last thing I was just going to show you so we can go on is just to show you the capacity for innovation in this field. And first to say here, this is, um, you could plot these oils in different ways and learn about them, but what's interesting about this is that the default plot here is emissions, total emissions, by API gravity of the oil. And API gravity of the oil, up until as conventional oils have been depleting, told you a lot of what you needed to know about the oil the economic value of the oil, how you would refine the oil, how you would handle the oil safely. Um, in many parts of the world, the gravity was defined by that part of the world. So that's why there is an American Petroleum Institute. API gravity was a very powerful characteristic of oil. But when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, there's not a correlation. So it doesn't, it tells us a lot about what oil had been and how to manage it, but when you think about climate impacts, it doesn't tell us enough. And I think that's a really big problem for the oil industry right now because they don't really have necessarily the data at their fingertips. It's buried in their industry to help them manage these oils better. But there's a lot of innovation that can take place in these oils. And I'll just show you a couple that Adam was, was mentioning. And you could play with this. So if you, as Adam was saying, and look at the curve and start to watch some of these bubbles go down. So if you don't flare you end up with emissions reductions. If you don't burn the, in the heavy oils, the pet coke, you see a reduction in emissions. If you use concentrated solar to generate your steam, you see reductions in emissions. If you manage your associated water really, really well, you see reductions in emissions. And if you use the um, refinery fuel gas, LPG, in your operations, you see reductions. So you can actually see the oil industry bending the curve on its emissions, which on face value might, might sound like compared to, say, renewables, not very much. But A, renewables aren't a great replacement for liquid fuels. But also B, when you talk about trillions of barrels, it adds up very, very quickly in terms of emissions reductions. So you can play with this. It's open source. Um, there's materials here that we've left. And feel free to take that at the end. And um, 
open it to you. Okay, so I want to ask just first one technical question and then one uh, institutional question, and then we'll move to audience questions. So the technical question relates to uncertainty. In each of the three parts of the model, the upstream, the midstream, and the transportation downstream side, there are uncertainties that affect those results. And I was hoping each of you could talk about the biggest factors in the uncertainty of the results for those sectors. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. We'll, we'll go with the value chain. So extraction is first. Um, we, we've written a couple of papers looking at uncertainty analysis uh, in our model. My my postdoc Mohammed is is currently working on a a, a very improved version of the model, which will include uh, as a default um, a Monte Carlo uncertainty assessment. I would say at this point, the largest uncertainty has to do with missing data. So what we call the front sheet of the model has about 50 characteristics of the oil field, its depth, its pressure, uh, how many wells they're producing, what's the wellbore diameter, lots of, uh, is the gas reinjected, is the gas sold, these sorts of things. Uh, often we're missing these data, in particular for global crudes, and so that's probably the biggest source of uncertainty right now is the lack of transparency um, around global oil sector um, activities. It's quite hard to get data on um, uh, oil production operations, especially in many of the developing countries and former Soviet Union regions. Um, and so uh, I, I would say at this point, the, the biggest challenge, in fact, is, is that we don't have all the data that we'd like to have. Yeah, and I'll, I work on the refining side, and, and similarly, the data uh, availability is the biggest issue. Um, so we take assay information about the characteristics of the crude itself uh, and then process that through the refinery. Um, there are a, quite a number of assays that are published online from oil companies, um, but we're still missing some really critical ones. So some of the um, the, the tight oils, uh, like the Eagleford and the Bakken uh, in the US, we have no public assays uh, to actually characterize those crudes um, or the variety of products that are coming from, from those, those assets. And so that is a really big problem. I think the other side, though, is also the variability. So how you choose to process those crudes, what types of refineries you actually put them through, and the types of products that you produce uh, creates a quite a bit of variability in the emissions on the refining side as well. So I'd say there, there are data issues, but there's also quite a bit of variability that you know, we're, we're increasingly being able to capture, um, still limited by the data though. And um, Carnegie did the OPAM, the product module, and counter to maybe a lot of perception, the transportation of product around the world, despite the fact that products do really travel the globe, um, in, in often tankers, that those emissions are actually relatively small. Obviously, on the downstream, the most, the largest emissions come from consuming the product. So um, the only thing I'll say about the transport, which is something that's very visible, and is, of course, after the Keystone Pipeline and the Dakota Access and a lot of infrastructure conversations, at least that we've been happening here, it's really the last mile in terms of moving product in trucks that become a really dominant factor in what the emissions will bear in terms of the downstream emissions. And then in terms of the combustion emissions, which up until now, until we did the oil climate index, there was always an assumption, there were two assumptions that were always frustrating. One was that all oil is gasoline or diesel. Like there was almost a one-to-one -one relationship, which it is not the case at all. And it's different for different oils. Some oils have a lot of gasoline associated with them. Some have a lot of bunker fuel associated with them. It's very variable. So a lot of that variability and uncertainty come from downstream in terms of how these oils are optimally or suboptimally in many cases around the world refined. Because how much emissions come from the barrel, the, the slate of products have everything to do with how you actually turn them into product in the first place. Great, okay, so the institutional question relates to the opportunity that understanding the oil supply chain opens up. Because in the past when we had the product focus, there was just an assumption that all that other stuff could somehow be averaged and, and come up with a reasonable number. But now we have this picture of the supply chain, and I think that opens up opportunities for institutions, like oil companies, either nationally owned or uh, in private oil companies, to differentiate themselves. And so I was hoping each of you, to the extent that you're comfortable sharing these uh, anecdotes, t could talk about conversations you've had with people in industry or in government who see an opportunity here for private sector and uh, government action to, to move emissions lower in the oil sector. 
Start? Sure. So this has become really interesting to me that the realizations here that oils are highly variable and how you manage them even introduces more um, differentiation between their greenhouse gas emissions. It opens up a very natural thing for the oil industry, which is competition very competitive industry. And a competitive industry, not the national oil companies, but the international oil companies, a competitive industry that's very light on their feet about whether they're involved in a certain asset class. They trade easily. It's very easy to get out of an asset and go into another asset, to swap resources, to, to, get, to, get, um, to go for a field that you decide not to, to develop. There's a lot of decision making that goes in there. So we're starting to see a bit of a race to the top in terms of who's going to, in a warming world, have that claim of having lower emitting oils. And so companies have started to approach us. In fact, at Stanford, last year, when we, when we released the first phase of the OCI, someone was there from Pemex, I remember, and they were very curious about what this all meant in terms of their oils and their national oil company. Um, recently, Adam and I are going to be going to Norway next month to talk to Statoil, because they have got a lot of questions about how they race to the top, and they become the company with the lowest emitting oils. All this is to say that this race to the top creates a lot of innovative capacity in this industry. And that is a very good thing for an industry that's kind of over 100 years old and can be a little bit stodgy at times. Uh, yeah, so just, just to add to what, to what Debbie said, this is, this is really of interest to, to a number of the producers. So we've been in contact with um, someone from Aramco, Saudi Aramco, this is interesting. They actually used our model with, a, with one of these proprietary global databases of you know, every oil field in the world. And as it turns out, Saudi Aramco, if you run all these fields, comes in, um, and actually the other field, the other company he mentioned was Statoil, comes in way at the bottom. Very prolific oil fields, much less depleted than a lot of the fields in North America, uh, quite easy to refine, high quality crudes. And so if you, if you look on a company by company basis, they said, hey, holy smokes, we, we, we come out looking pretty good. Let's own this. Let's start to use this as a source of strategic advantage. And so there's a lot of interest from that company in particular about trying to uh, understand this, and I think that's a that's a opens up a big opportunity, as Debbie said, as companies start to sort of own this and 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 uh, move forward and 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 sort of stake a claim as uh, a more climate friendly oil resource. I think that's going to carry increasing weight going forward, regardless of what happens in the next four years or so. And I'll just make a quick comment about innovation as well. So looking across the supply chain for innovation opportunities, uh, companies typically have a very good handle on the economics of those innovations and, and where they're going to see the economic value within their portion of the supply chain. But understanding what the climate impacts of that are um, across the entire supply chain is something that some companies don't necessarily have at hand. And so using these types of tools to help inform those types of uh, decisions as well as the implications of different uh, innovation uh, is, is another area that I've seen this be applied. Okay, so for the first time, there's visibility into the whole climate impact of the whole value chain. And people even who don't own everything from the production all the way to the, the sales still will have some idea of what the total emissions are, and that's a new thing. Yeah, So, and, and I would note that it's, it's, it's not always straightforward what the best option is, right? So a big, a big issue up in Canada has been on-site upgrading versus, versus um, uh, shipping diluted uh, heavy bitumen. And, there, and there's back and forth arguments, obviously, about the economics. But what, which choice is better for the environment is actually a, a reasonably complicated question that, that Jewel in particular has been spending a lot of time on. Yeah, and I was to say another thing, Adam and I have spoken a lot about this, that this really benefits something way beyond oil, that if you really are considering these marginal oils and considering the cal their emissions calculus, you change the cost benefit results of electrification of the transport sector or biofuels. Because if you're comparing those alternatives to average oil, which doesn't even exist, as Adam was showing you, that if you're comparing it to some sort of non-existent minimalist past, you're really undercounting the benefits of alternatives. So a more honest, full accounting of oils in their different states and the different options, both economically and environmentally, really changes the face of alternatives in a very positive way. Right, and the focus on marginal oils, the ones that are more likely to be developed yeah. in response to changes in technology and prices, yeah. gives you a different answer yes. than if you look at 
average oil. And that's kind of the big picture takeaway from this work is that when you just look, you assume that oil is one thing or that oil products are one thing, you miss out on the potential for innovation throughout the supply chain. And that turns out to be a big omission. So with that, I think uh, we have about 15 more minutes. And so I'd like to turn to audience questions. I, I would ask that if you ask a question, please first state your name, tell us your institution, and then ask a brief question so that as many people as possible can answer que uh, ask questions. And we Jim. tend to want to get students first, oh, too. Students Jim, first. Jim, Sorry, you're, Jim. You're, a, you're a lifelong student, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, could you help me with, I'll call it the math of the index. Here's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Let's say you had two fields. One that is producing everything very efficient, no loss, but it produces a lot of the very heavy products, very carbon. The other is quite inefficient in everything down the line, but it's producing lots of light products, very little heavy products. Your index, I would guess, would show that the first one was was a worse oil because it has a more heavy product. It may or may not, depending yeah. upon the numbers, but it. it is that misleading given, given that there's a supply and demand and there's going to be a market for both the light and the heavy products? You sort of cook the books by uh, mixing the product mix along with the, the quality of the way it's processed. Yes, that's a very good question. I'll, I'll start on that. So um, uh, heavier, oil, heavier, heavier oils tend to have larger emissions. They also tend to have more revenue of final product. So that's per larger per barrel. Larger per barrel. And so, yeah, and, and really, you know, barrel is a volumetric term. What actually, you know, adds value are carbon and hydrogen molecules. And so de density there actually increases your emissions and increases your value. You can actually, on the web tool, change the index. So it's per dollar of final product um, produced, for examples, or per megajoule of final product. And we have the energy intensities plus market values of some of these products. And those could be quite different. From those, those, barrel can, ranking. those can be quite different. So per, per unit of energy, pet coke trades often is at a, at a not even at coal. Uh, it's, it tends to be actually dirtier uh, than coal, higher sulfur, higher metal content. So it's actually even lower valued per BTU than coal. And so the relative mix there can really affect, uh, you, you may get one ordering if it's per barrel, one ordering per, uh, per dollar. I, I would say that the per barrel approach is interesting just because it's a more relevant factor for people interested in thinking about ideas around stranded assets, valuing the assets of a, of a regulated region, um, uh, portfolios of companies, what they're invested in, this sort of stuff. So it's, it's flipping it on its head. It doesn't tell you everything. Maybe in some cases you'd want to look at a, a final product oriented number like per liter of gasoline, and that might tell you more. But I, I do think the per barrel actually adds some um, nuance or different perspective to the argument. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think you get around the problem that you're thinking about cooking the books because we're not just talking about total emissions. What you do is you look at the upstream and the midstream and the downstream components to those emissions. And so the upstream and the midstream are going to be where your inefficiencies, because those are operations in terms of energy in as opposed to carbon out which is what the consumption side is. So you can actually see for different oils, is this an oil that has 90% of, of its emissions in consumption? Some oils only have 60% of their emissions in consumption of final product, which says that there's a lot of room for improvement of how they actually deal with that oil and move it into product. So it opens up the door to understand your oil in terms of where its individual challenges lie. And, and I would note, we've also, we've also had a lot of discussions with, with um, the folks about how to think about the pet coke market. And that's a really interesting question. So pretty large volumes of pet coke are being produced. It's a low value product. There's not really a central sort of um, WTI or Brent like clearing price for coke. It's sold in kind of bilateral contracts in a more ad hoc fashion. Um, there's real questions about, let's say we move to oils that produce less pet coke, what happens, right? Is more coal simply mined in China and India? You know, this this is a question, right? So it, 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 I think the way to think about it is it kind of dumps a low value, low cost source of, you can think of it like coal but dirtier onto international markets. Um, and in many cases it's burned in poorly regulated um, uh, facilities, very high sulfur uh, content, very high metals content. So even if it were being replaced by coal, 
um, it may actually be a benefit. But yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. It deals with the interaction of of all these markets because the markets will control in the end what mix of of products are consumed. Oh, sure. I can add quickly is the um, this is very much an attributional LCA, so it's sort of a snapshot of individual pathways. It's not necessarily a comparison of you know satisfying the demands of different products in a particular market. But I think it's a really good jumping off point to try and look at some of the macroeconomic analysis that you could do, and it provides information that could be used for that to say if you stopped producing one of these pathways, what would the consequence be? What how does the the market react to that, and what are the consequences of that shift? Um, that I think is a jumping off point for for that analysis, but this is very much a, a static snapshot of individual pathways. Okay, next question. Let's see if we find a student first. Any student? Perpetual? Perpetual <laughs> student. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, wait, well, wait, wait, there's a student over here. Oh, you got a student. Sorry. Please, go ahead. <laughs> You're the teacher. You're the teacher. <laughs> Own it. To be. Um, my name is Gracia. I'm from ERE also. But I would like to ask you, imagine that you are now working to the, for the government, you're not in school. So in US or Canada, you're working for the government and you want to uh, encourage oil companies to reduce emissions. But if they reduce their emissions, like these topics take a lot of investment. So how do you do it? If you tell me about taxes or regulations that could reduce attractiveness of oil projects, so how can you address this? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> Debbie, do you want to go yeah. first and I'll noodle on sure, it? Sure, yeah. sure. I mean, I think that there's a lot of investment in infrastructure globally. If you think about had this tool been available, and had the concern for climate become Paris happened 10 years earlier, then questions of the US refining infrastructure becoming very dominated by cokers and heavy refining, it might have been a very different conversation. And had we found light tight, or, you know, had light tight oil happen earlier. So sometimes it's a little chicken and egg with this industry. But you can use this tool, had certain awarenesses happened a little bit earlier, I think we would have had a whole different investment direction than what we have right now. The same question that I raised when I testified before Congress about lifting the crude oil export ban, I asked them with this tool in hand, do you know what you're going to export? Do you know what carbon flows you're going to commit from lifting the ban on exporting crude oil? And it's a tool like this that can actually look at those oils moving elsewhere in terms of understanding that. So you end up with investment decisions on ports, on pipelines, on refineries. Um, I think that you need these kinds of questions if you are, as the title of the talk is, if you're gonna consider oil in a warming world. You need to be able to ask questions that compare these different oils. And that's where government, you know, government investment ends up becoming, or governments actually give a lot of money if you're, you know, say in China right now, what direction should China go? Which oils should they prepare to import? should indeed be taking the US's pet coke. I mean, these are really important questions of climate change that I think happen without a tool like this under the veil. They're very, they're very opaque and you can't see what's going on until it's usually too late. Uh, um, real quick, I mean, there's, there's a couple things going on. W one interesting thing is that um, oil has a very large value per unit of carbon compared to other fuel sources because it's, it's sold as essentially at this point in history a premium transport fuel in most markets. So if you look at carbon taxes that will have very high impacts on let's say the electricity generation sector, $50 a ton, would totally change the economics of your, of your, your, um, of your electric grid, would have quite small impacts um, here, right? Um, so this is an, this is one of the challenges in, in oil sector emissions is that um, it's not clear how to do this because it's not clear that a carbon tax uh, would be particularly effective at realistic levels, especially at current levels of carbon prices in, in California or in the EU. Carbon prices are definitely too low to have much effect on, on oil resource investment. Um, you know, th there, there are a couple of examples of, of uh, jurisdictions or regions using these types of numbers to, to guide investment decisions. 
And so one, uh, one example is California, what's called the low carbon fuel standard as a regulation that aims to reduce the carbon intensity of transport fuels in California. And it's sort of sectioned off and carved out as its own regulation because of this issue of the ineffectiveness of a general carbon price in affecting transport futures. And so in that uh, regulation, crude oils of various types are scored and actually there's given sort of a statewide baseline value of carbon intensity that companies can try and beat to obtain credits. And so that kind of approach um, with a carbon price, um, you know, is perhaps the best way to incentivize um, development. But you know, there, there, there's actually a lot of international action going on um, that didn't necessarily require a carbon price. So the, um, Oman, um, Petroleum Development Oman has invested in what's the, the largest solar thermal power plant in the world, it's one gigawatt. Uh, enormous solar thermal power plant to replace the use of gas in some of the heavy oil operations, which is one of the options we have there. And that's not really carbon price driven, that's value of gas, and they have a great solar resource and this sort of thing. But I, I think there's a lot of examples um, out there that are a bit one off, and it's unclear what the overall you know, regulatory framework should be. I'll just say quickly the Canadian example. So in in the case of the oil sands in Alberta, uh, the industry was actually much further ahead than the government until recently. So the government is moving forward with carbon pricing. Um, but the industry had already formed an alliance of companies where they're sharing IP to try and innovate and, and develop. They were very cognizant of the challenges associated with the oil sands and things like that already. So they're already moving in that direction. And we've seen some incremental benefits from that in terms of the innovation that's coming forward. One of the things that the federal government recently did was uh, fund uh, universities to try and look at basic basic science, basic material science breakthroughs and things like that that are needed to actually rethink the resource altogether. So can you get the energy out without the carbon? Um, so these are longer term, high risk, but potentially high payoff opportunities. And so taking it back into the sort of university level research uh, is another tactic. Okay, so let's go to this perpetual student and then to that perpetual student. Uh, okay, so I have a statement and then a question. The, the statement is we cannot burn another four trillion barrels. That's just fact. <laughs> yeah. Science. So we, we absolutely can, but <laughs> no, whether we should, no, no, whether we should is another question. Because the one, one third about of the 1.78 trillion barrels burn. Uh, Let, let's just accept okay, so never mind. Go ahead. Never mind. The question is your gas management. The, the leakage. NASA sees a cloud of methane over Texas and Arkansas. Are you taking that into account as the emissions of the oil business? Okay. Yeah, so are, those, those are included. They're very uncertain. We actually have a contract right now with the California Air Resources Board to dig into that. Tons of science ongoing. We're doing some science here working with Rob Jackson. Uh, I would say at this point we know way too little about, about where the methane is coming from. There's been a bunch of work over the last couple of years. Most of it focused on, the, on gas infrastructure rather than oil. Um, uh, but yeah, there, there are some studies out there, but not nearly enough information. You mentioned the satellite. I think there's a lot of opportunity in the long run for methane sensing satellites to be a first kind of global pass at where, where methane is coming from to target. Yeah. But yeah, that's a very, very good point. We're working on it, you know, every day. Um, and it can change a lot of the results. It can change a lot well, of the results because that's relatively that's small that's amounts that's of methane that's because that's the global warming potential, exactly. you guys, it's, it's, it'll, it'll, these numbers will, will flip all around. And, and I'll just add that it's very sad, but in the, the oil and gas industry is often, you know, agglomerated. You have oil and gas. The reality is some are oil, some are gas, and some are both. The oil industry is much more willing to vent and flare their gas than the gas industry is. And for many obvious reasons, I mean, gas is your business. So mishaps really will be a gas problem, but as a normal course of business, gas is what you're trying to sell. The oil industry sees gas as a nuisance. The oil industry doesn't want to deal with that gas. They're getting a lot more value for their oil. And we've even, we've even heard recently from some companies that with these low prices of oil, it's a lot cheaper to vent than it is to flare, which is a big problem. So you, what, what we're saying is that your, your model should be going into the local governments that say, here's what you need to regulate. Definitely. I mean, there's a lot of talk about regulating methane. The, the issue is going to be doing it quickly enough and honestly enough, and I agree with Adam. I think that satellite technology, um, you know, trying to get 
get EPA to be able to, you know, somehow pierce NASA's, you know, purview of satellites has been a bit challenging, I think, for that agency. But it's there, and for drones too. It's a real issue, and it's going to be a growing issue, I okay, would say. Okay, so I am told that we are out of time, but I would ask this gentleman to come up and ask his question oh, okay. afterwards, and then... All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs>